I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. There's been a significant shift toward awareness and understanding regarding mental health, especially since the pandemic. Today, we're going to talk about therapy and does it really work? But first, the Russia-Ukraine war this week may be a turning point. Small gains near Bakhmut, raising Ukraine's hope of a changing tide. For the first time in months, the Ukrainian soldiers are on the offensive when it comes to the bloodiest and longest battle of the war. Joining me to discuss what's happening is Mark Santora, New York Times correspondent who's covering in Kiev. And let's thank you for joining us, Mark, and hope you're safe over there. We're in a New York Times studio at CUNY TV. I can be in the newsroom. Most of our viewers are probably home thinking about dinner or going to the movies. What's it like being in a war zone now uh, in the middle of bombs falling and people shooting each other? Well, Sam, it's good to see you again. First of all, it's been a while. Um, so I just got back from a trip out east near Bakhmut, where the epicenter of the violence is. And the front line of this war has largely been frozen for six months or so. Um, and so this movement out there, there, you know, the war is, is very present every day. The front line, you can hear it from miles away, the, the level of destruction, the fighting. So along those front line towns and villages, obviously things are, are more intense. But then you come back here to Kyiv, and it's a different kind of threat. We've now had nine days this month of Russian missile attacks aimed at the capital here, including ballistic missiles in numbers we haven't seen before. And so almost nightly this month, we've had these sort of dueling air battles that you can see out your window where newly arrived air defense systems are shooting interceptor missiles up at these incoming ballistic missiles and other rockets that the Russians are firing. So you definitely get the sense of an intensification all around. How unsafe do you feel being in Ukraine right now? Well, again, I think, you know, it's a city of 3.6 million people here in Kyiv. And, you know, we obviously, you know, every, there's a certain amount of risk when rockets are falling on a city like that. But it's really, you know, for the Ukrainian people, it's, it's first of all, it's exhausting. And there have been different phases. If we're just talking about in Kyiv and, and the larger cities that are not on the front line, the threats have sort of evolved over the course of the war. The Russians first tried to seize Kyiv. They failed. They were pushed back right outside in the suburbs here. You can still see the destroyed buildings from where they tried to do that and the torture chambers and other places where they committed atrocities. And then we moved into the winter, and that's when Russia tried to basically make this country plunged into darkness. So they attacked energy facilities, and, and they were perilously close here to basically wrecking the energy grid. Ukraine survived the winter, and they've, the grid is now working. There's constant power and electricity. And now Ukraine is preparing to go on the counteroffensive more broadly than Bakhmut. And so at this moment, Russia seems to be changing its tactics again and aiming its strikes at the heart of the government here in Kyiv with an intensity we haven't really seen before. So, you know, the, the war has gone on a long time, but there, it's, it's, it keeps evolving. I think uh, many times readers, viewers, uh, when they imagined that Russia was invading Ukraine, they had visions of World War I, World War II, and maybe five million people in a Russian army were mobilized and had visions of the Russians just overwhelming Ukraine. Why is it different this time? Why has this war gone on so long? Yeah, well, I think that's a, you know, there's probably many answers to that question, but I think the Russian initial invasion plans seeking to take the entire country with, you know, the number of troops that they intended to do it with and not expecting the Ukrainian resistance to be what it was, um, was just misguided from the beginning. And then there's a series of problems that have plagued the Russian military throughout this campaign. But also just at its very core, Ukraine is an independent country and it's got its own history, its own culture, and they're going to fight for that. And I think, you know, there was a, maybe, you know, Russia convinced themselves of their own lies about what this war was about. And so you base a war on a lie and you're going to start with a problem, probably. Did we, by... Uh... Uh, welcoming the Eastern European nations into NATO sort of feed Putin's and Russia's paranoia? I thankfully am not charged with getting inside Putin's head. That is a reporting assignment. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't know how to begin. So with, without saying going into what he's thinking, we just know what he's done. 
And what he's done is take what was a peaceful country that was growing and sure plagued with its own problems. And he's basically, you know, you've got, he's controlling about 17% of the country. Every place Russian troops have gone, when they've been driven out, you hear tor stories of atrocities and war crimes committed. And, you know, even for the people like here in Kyiv who are far from that front line, these are just families who every night their children, you know, wake up to the sound of an explosion running down to shelters. It's, um, you know, it, it really is hard to believe and understand why it's happening, honestly. A lot of people remember Ukrainians from World War II when they weren't necessarily uh, performing in the best of circumstances. We know the Russians in this case are the bad guys. Are Ukrainians the good guys? I mean, you know, Sam, in our business, it's very hard to talking clear, you know, clear lines, but I think in this case, the, they, the Russians are the clear aggressors, and there's a moral clarity to the Ukrainian cause here, fighting for their own freedom and in the face of an, of an enemy that is using, you know, tactics that, that most of us find both shocking and illegal. So in that sense, without a doubt. And I think, again, you know, I was based in Poland before here. The history of World War II in Eastern and Central Europe is super complicated, and it's not, you know, we sort of, you know, it sort of depends who, who wrote it in the end. But, you know, throughout that period, they were sort of caught between the Nazis and the Russians. And so it's a very complicated history, that Second World War history here. Is there any win-win solution, any compromise that both sides could actually live with? I mean, you know, I think I, I cover Ukraine. I don't cover Russia. So I can speak to the Ukrainians. And, and uh, no, given the suffering they've gone through, the threat that they're facing, the fact that there's no sign that Russia is stopping or relenting in its attacks unless it just runs out of material to do those attacks, like precision missiles, they, the, the only solution for the Ukrainians is get out of our country, go back to the borders internationally recognized, and then we'll have peace. And, you know, the, the Kremlin has made it clear that that's not what it wants. So and any pause in the fighting, the Ukrainians fear will just give the Russians an opportunity to rearm, to build up their supplies and attack again. So, you know, I think we're about to enter a period here where the Ukrainians go back on the offensive more broadly and everyone's watching to see, can they drive the Russians out militarily? And if they can't in a, in a broad way, then I think those discussions of how do you stop the violence maybe get louder. But I think everyone's just watching to see these next six months and how they unfold. And is there any point where the West draws the line in giving weapons to Ukraine? I mean, I mean again, you know, I, I, I imagine there's always a line somewhere. People are watching what's happening in the U.S. Polit political realm, mm -hmm. where Congress sits. Um, but at the moment, they, they seem committed to giving them, um, you know, nearly every category of weapon they've asked for outside of fighter jets and some long-range weapons. Um, so the Ukrainians still would like some more. They think it would speed up the ability to drive the Russians out. But so far, the West has held steady and united. So I don't see any change in the immediate future. And what about the Russians? I mean, you, you're not going to analyze Putin, of course. But is there any line that they have drawn or likely to draw in terms of aggression? Uh, honestly, I, I, it, I have no idea. I think what we, we just watched their behavior. And so they've gone through rounds of partial mobilization. They brought convicts into this war to keep feeding into the war machine. They've, they launch missiles across the country, you know, over a thousand over the course of the war and cities far from the front line. You, like I mentioned, you know, they're going after the government center here in Kyiv. So I think the bigger fear is if Russia, again, they've, they've lost, they've already retreated two or three times, depending on how you count it. If they're forced into retreat again, I think the bigger fear is, well, if he's, you know, losing and losing badly, how, how does he respond? What can he do? to try and change that course. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I don't know the answer to that. Are the Ukrainian people full-fledged in favor of this war, in favor of Zelensky? They're in favor of keeping their homes, not having Russian occupation forces that have demonstrated themselves to be, um, you know, the, the level of atrocities and war crimes committed. Yes, they're 100% they're behind securing the freedom of their country. And at the moment, they're firmly behind their leader and they're firmly behind their military. And it's kind of remarkable the amount of unity you see here. There is really no, you know, it was a country that had a lot of divisions before, like every country, but this is an existential struggle. It's a struggle for survival. And I think you see that reflected 
almost everywhere you go. What do you do differently as a reporter in this war zone? I mean, it depends what you're doing and where you're doing it. But, you know, you, you, you know, the, the closer you are to the front line, we do embed with with Ukrainian military units sometimes. Um, when it comes to the, the missile strikes here, we've all become expert at, you know, when the alarm goes off, if it's cruise missiles, we have two, three hours to wait. If it's drones, we have a little longer. With the ballistic missiles, you get maybe as little as 20 to 30 minutes warning. So, you know, you become aware of, of these things and then, you know, over time, but you can't rush to, or at least I don't, rush to a shelter every time there's an alarm because you would basically, I think they did a calculation in Kyiv over the past 15 months, if you went to a shelter and stayed in the shelter the entire duration, you would have spent the equivalent of 835 hours in bomb shelters. Let yeah. me ask you a silly question. Woody Allen said the Russian Revolution began when the serfs realized that the Tsar and the Tsar were the same person. When did uh, Kiev with an I become Kiev with a Y? I think, you know, really going back to 2014 when Russia illegally annexed Crimea and we had the start of the fomenting of the, the, the violence in the eastern Donbass where the fighting is still the worst, that was the beginning of it. And then I think, you know, over the course of those years, I only came here for the first time two weeks before the war started, but our colleagues have been coming for years said, you know, then you saw that it was the Maidan protests and the, you know, the, the, the sort of just sense of wanting to be a part of Europe and, and European values and culture. So over 2014 to the outbreak of this war, I think there was a gradual steady kind of, you know, thing going on here where the country was moving culturally, militarily, economically, in many ways closer to Europe and the West, and the Kremlin found that threatening. Mark Santor, New York Times correspondent in Kyiv. Thank you so much for joining us. And coming up next, new research about therapy. Does it work? May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and the topic continues to be on the forefront of discussion from actors, athletes, regular people, royalty, and this week's New York Times Magazine is the therapy issue. It's available online. And the question being asked, does therapy really work? Here to explain is Susan Dominus from the New York Times Magazine. And let me ask you something. I was in therapy once, and uh, the woman who was the therapist smoked a lot. The phone was always ringing. There were cats running around her office. She was fairly helpful, I have to admit, but a couple of years later when she died, I read her obituary in the New York Times and I discovered she was a gynecologist. <laughs> now, so tell me, does therapy really work? Uh, I think it helps if the person is trained probably as an actual psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, the, you know, the answer is pretty complicated, actually, and you have to start by asking, you know, by work, what do we mean? Good question. How do you measure whether it works? It's easy to, when you take someone's temperature, you can see if they no longer have a fever. Uh, I was always a little confused by those one to ten pain charts, you know, how much pain are you really in? But how do you know when therapy works? How do you know when you're really depressed as opposed to just being in a bad mood or blue? How do you quantify something like that? So um, there is a lot of controversy about whether the way that these things are researched is truly meaningful, but the way that most um, psychology researchers approach it is they measure symptom reductions. So in order to have a diagnosis of like a major depressive disorder, there's a certain number of symptoms associated with that disorder. And they'll ask a patient at the beginning how many of, of the treatment, how many of those symptoms they have, and then again at the end. And if they've reached a certain threshold of symptom, symptom reduction, reduction, um, that's either considered responding or even remitting, which is to say the issue has been sort of resolved, at least temporarily. So they're counting symptoms. It's like a checklist, basically. And, and that's, you know, one way to measure it. Um, there are people who feel like that is a sort of um, underambitious measurement of people's well-being and how they find, you know, it doesn't capture people's sort of how, how meaningful their lives are, how connected they feel to people. So, as I said, it's, it's, it's not an easy question and it's um, not always satisfying. Uh, Susan, you wrote in the Times Magazine that when you went into therapy for the first time, there was sort of still a stigma attached to it. In, for New Yorkers, isn't there almost a stigma attached to not being in therapy? 
I don't exactly know specifically what the public opinion um, measures are in New York about this, but I do think, especially since the pandemic, there has been an increasing awareness about um, openness about mental health problems and that you know, sort of a destigmatization de of seeking help. It does seem very commonplace, and we do know that the numbers of people who have sought therapy nationwide from every walk of life, not just you know the elite or the coastals, um, but that that has definitely increased over the years. As you point out in the article, there's so many different kinds of therapy now, uh, psychodynamic therapy, foreman, uh, psychoanalysis, talk therapy, cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy. How do you know which one to choose or whom to go to? It's a really great question because there is debate in the field even about whether there is a huge difference among the kinds of therapy in terms of the results that you'll get. There are some there's some research also widely criticized that finds what's known as the dodo bird effect, which is um, it's, it's a it's a term taken from a, um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland book. But the idea is that all therapies are kind of equally effective. Um, uh, and there are researchers, Bruce Wampold, chief among them, who would argue that um, it's really the quality of the therapist that makes the difference rather than the kind of treatment. Many, many therapists now do draw from different treatments. There is some research also contested that suggests that for anxiety in particular, cognitive behavioral therapy is the most effective and the most direct um, in a short period of time. Um, but it's, it's really because there are so many different ways to critique the various methodologies. There are always people on other, you know, on various sides of the debate who will say that their method is equal to others or superior. Why is it called the dodo bird effect? Um, there's a line from the book um, in which the dodo is, uh, this bird is asked to judge a, a race, and apparently the, the line is, if I'm not getting it exactly right, it's something like, um, all have uh, all have won and all have, and all shall have prizes. So the idea is all these treatments do work to some degree, and they work about uh, as effectively as each other. Does therapy resolve the symptoms, or does it actually cure the basic causes of, of distress or depression? Um, I don't think they can really get at the answer to that. We don't mm -hmm. know the mechanisms by which symptoms are reduced. It's one of the things that researchers are really working on studying, and it's complicated. But I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that's something they're trying to resolve. And you know, one of the things they're also looking into is what are the components of therapy that are consistent across all the different kinds mm -hmm. of therapies? If we can figure that out and get rid of the, the ineffective uh, aspects of it, is, this, is there a possibility we can really nail it down to like, these are the five things that we know work in these circumstances. Maybe we could also try to figure out for which people, what kinds of people uh, certain therapies are most effective. Can we do a better pairing of therapy and patient? Because it's hard to get sample sizes large enough to show effect sizes. And so then if you even try to cut it in half by gender, you don't have a big enough sample to generate um, a, an accurate reading. So now people are trying to go back and collect all the information about all of these studies that have been on, done in the past and try to generate more specifics about women versus men or people who have long-term depression versus short-term depression, that kind of thing. And you say the, probably the most important quality in a therapist is empathy. I think that makes sense. What they talk about is, uh, and again, this is also, you know, there are people who contest this and say that um, it's it, that there's a chicken egg situation going on. But there are people who believe that the alliance, the sense of um, bonding and trust that is established quickly between a therapist and a patient is the single biggest factor in whether somebody is going to see results more so, say, mm -hmm. than age of therapist, experience of therapist, all the th training, the kinds of things that you would assume would matter, um, that it really comes down to a certain connection and sense of safety and trust that somebody has with a therapist who's trying to help them. For a long time, insurance did not cover psychological, psychiatric therapy. Does it now for the most part? I think widely, yes. Mm. To, you know, not forever um, and not completely, but. You, well, how does that work when they say you've got to be cured in 12 sessions? What happens on, you know, when you need the 13th? Yeah, I know, I think there is a, you know, I think that that is a, that it, you know, one of the critiques I'm sure people feel reading this article is not the question of, well, exactly how well does it work, but really how can we get more people who need it access mm -hmm. to it? Even people who find that the effect sizes aren't 
overwhelmingly positive still feel like they do help to some degree and there are huge populations that are not getting access to even that help and at, at, at an epidemiological scale even though small effect sizes could have tremendous benefits. Overall. Talking anything through I think is always a good idea with a therapist or almost anyone but what about some of the technological breakthroughs uh, uh, that can sort of work with therapy. Neuroimaging is something you talk about. If you can look at the brain and you know find specific areas that may be affected or uh, medical treatment, uh, medicine that may also complement the therapy. Yes, for depression, there's a lot of research to suggest, for example, that um, therapy in conjunction with medication is more effective than either therapy or medication alone. I think that's important for people to to think about, um, you know, the effect sizes for across all mental illnesses, if you generalize the effect sizes for medication is also known to be um, a real effect. You know, obviously it does help a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of discussion right now, but, but even that people aren't satisfied with the reliability of those results. And so there's a call for a lot more innovation. People are looking into ketamine increasingly um, for, for depression, especially in, you know, untreatable depression. Um, one of the doctors I interviewed, one of the, sorry, researchers I interviewed was interested in a certain drug that targets the part of the brain that's known to be most active during cognitive behavioral therapy. So mm. I think, you know, this, there was this article published in World Psychiatry, which is one of the most influential um, medical journals for the field of psychiatry that basically said, this has been working okay, but we really need to be thinking big and calling for much bigger innovations to increase the rates of effectiveness. Susan, quickly, uh, you recently wrote in the Times, too, that women are being misled about menopause. You got a lot of reaction to that article. Yeah, it turns out that um, a lot of women we're having trouble, I think, getting answers to some very basic questions about what was happening to them. I was watching a TV show the other day, and um, a woman says to the to her, I think it was um, somebody somewhere is the TV show. The woman says to someone, well, I'm in perimenopause. And the person says, what is that? How is that different from menopause? And she said, I don't know. Nobody knows. And that, that was, I think, many women's experience. So there was a hunger for information. And I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to be given the space to unpack a lot of it. And how were they being misled? Well, there was a famous um, study from the Women's Health Initiative that was uh, very alarmist, I think, in the way that it pre pre um, presented some of the statistics in the mainstream media about how much it increased, how much hormone um, therapy increased women's risk of, say, breast cancer or um, heart disease. And since then, new medications have, new formulations have come along that at least observational studies suggest are safer than the ones that were used in that study. Um, and also I think when women really understand what the risk actually is, they can better weigh whether it's worth it to them to take that risk in order to alleviate their symptoms. Many doctors just decided it was bad for women straight out based on the way the information was presented and how the other problem was that at the time of the study, 2002, many women thought that hormones had no risks and that they were only good for you. And mm -hmm. so the finding that there were any risks at all was very alarming to people. But it's important to put those risks in context, especially for women who are really suffering, really uncomfortable, really struggling with, you know, pain, um, hot flashes, uh, memory problems, those kinds of things. Thanks to Susan Dominus, staff writer for The New York Times Magazine. And coming up next, my thoughts on public officials and the law. Remember when Donald Trump once said he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and he wouldn't lose any supporters? It's arguable whether Trump, who has already gotten away with so much, could also get away with murder. But this month, once again, the Supreme Court made it easier for politicians and public officials to escape prosecution for what most reasonable people would consider malfeasance. In overturning the bribery conviction of Joseph Percoco, a former aide to Governor Andrew Cuomo, the court plucked yet another arrow from the quiver that prosecutors use to combat corruption. The question in this case was whether Percoco was a public official when he accepted what federal prosecutors said was more than $300,000 from executives of two companies with state business in return for taking official actions on their behalf. Percoco claimed he was a private citizen at the time because he was no longer running as Cuomo's executive deputy secretary. 
he had stepped down from that position to run Cuomo's re-election campaign. He would return to his state job after Cuomo was re-elected. The Supreme Court unanimously overturned his conviction. Justice Samuel Alito wrote that the trial judge's charge to the jury was too vague. It wasn't the proper test of whether a private person may be convicted of honest services fraud. The jury had been asked to determine whether Prococo had a special relationship with the government and had dominated government business during that hiatus. In 2016, the court overturned former Virginia Governor Robert McDonald's bribery conviction. The court concluded then that the quid hadn't justified the pro, that whatever gifts McDonald received didn't count as bribes because the favors he did for his benefactor weren't official enough. Roughly the same reasoning applied when charges were initially dismissed against New York Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver and Senate Majority Leader Dean Skelos. Justices Neil Gorsuch and Clarence Thomas wrote that Justice Alito's ruling itself was too vague. They said, and they were right, that the court, Congress, or someone now needs to define how honest the public should expect its public officials to be. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.